A week or so ago, we made a video about building a dovetail workstation. It's sort of a portable workbench that can go on top of any stable surface to provide the clamping and other features required to cut all sorts of joinery, including dovetails. It's ideal for those without a traditional workbench. But even if you have a fully capable bench like I do, this workstation lifts your work up to a more comfortable level for cutting joinery. If you want to build your own, I'll put a link below to a set of plans including photos and step-by-step -step instructions, as well as a complete guide for hand cutting dovetails that you can print out and take to the shop with you to help walk you through your first dovetail project. Today we're going to use it to cut the dovetails for the tool tray that slides inside and holds all your gear. Even if you don't plan on building the workstation itself, this video and that guide will be a good primer for hand cutting dovetails on any project. This drawer is just a simple four-sided box. All the parts are milled flat and to the same thickness. The dovetailing process is exactly the same, whether they be a half inch thick, three quarters, nine sixteenths, seventeen thirty seconds, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that they are all flat and the edges are square. It's very difficult to cut tight gapless joinery if your boards are cupped or twisted or warped. I cut my pieces to length by measuring right off the opening of the workstation. I want a 1 16th to 1 8th inch gap all the way around so the drawer will slide freely without binding. A drawer like this is made up of two short front and back pieces and two long side pieces. The side pieces always get the tails half of the joint. The front and the back get the pins half. So I label the ends of all of my work pieces with a T for tails or a P for pins. I'm placing these labels on what will be the inside faces of the drawer once it's assembled. This will help me keep track of my parts and their orientation as I work. Here I'm setting a marking gauge to the thickness of one of my tails boards. Because I milled all my work pieces to the same thickness, I only have to set this gauge one time. This greatly simplifies the process. I use the gauge to scribe lines across both faces on both ends of both pin boards. Then I do the same thing on the tails board, except on these I scribe lines on the edges as well. These are your base lines. Do not cut past them. Again, because my tails boards and my pin boards are of equal thickness, I can mark all these base lines with one marking gauge setting. Now I get to lay out my joint. A pins board is secured to the front of the workstation with the labeled inside face turned away from me. Joint layout is a matter of personal preference. And while you can use special tools to achieve even spacing, a shallow drawer such as this can be laid out by eye. I simply place marks about a quarter inch from each corner. Then I eyeball the center and place a pair of marks there about an eighth of an inch apart. This is a dovetail marker. It's a quick way to carry those marks across the end grain at the angles I want for the sides of my pins. These angles are mostly arbitrary. Just do what looks good to you. They don't even all have to be precisely the same. But a dovetail marker, especially a saddle style like this one, does make it easier to extend your marks across both the end grain and down the face of the board to your scribe baseline. Because this is a pins board, I'll be cutting away the larger waste areas. Mark them well so you don't forget what's waste and what's not. I have to repeat this layout on both ends of both pins boards. To make it faster, I create a little story stick, which I can use to transfer the same layout from one board to the next, so all four of my joints in the drawer look the same. Story sticks like this are one of those timeless woodworking secrets that everyone should know about. Time to cut. Accurate dovetailing is all about getting comfortable so you don't have to turn or move your body in unnatural positions. That's why I like this workstation. It raises your work up where it's a lot more comfortable for sawing. I can position my body, turn to the right or to the left, depending on which side of the pin I'm cutting, so I'm simply pushing the saw forward rather than angling my arm. Now my only real concern is that I cut straight downward. If you can cut straight down, you can cut dovetails. Of course, if my workpiece is crooked, my cuts won't be straight, so I made sure to secure it perpendicular to the floor. I begin each cut on the waist side of my pencil line, using my thumb as a fence so the saw's teeth won't skip out of position as I cut into the wood. If your saw is sharp, it should only take a few strokes to reach your baseline. Do not cut past your baseline, especially on the side of the board facing you, because that's the side that will be visible on the outside of the drawer. You may tilt the heel of the saw a bit toward the floor so you reach that baseline on the workpiece first, then tilt the toe down 
to complete the cut to the baseline on the opposite side of the board. You may notice that my saw is sticking a little bit in the kerf as I cut. My shaky hands make it look worse than it is, but this can also be solved with a little beeswax on the side of the saw plate. When you've made your cuts, you can use a coping saw to remove the bulk of the waste between the pins. This is why we marked those waste areas. I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone accidentally cut off the pins instead of the waste between them. I'm cutting as close to the scribe baseline as I dare without going over it. The less waste I leave here, the less chiseling I'll have to do later. Speaking of chiseling, the workpiece is clamped to the top of the workstation where the area is reinforced for strength and the surface is replaceable if your chisel chews it up over time. I'm using some new chisels I just got. These are Japanese dovetail chisels. They're made with steep sloping sides so you can get them into the angled corners between your dovetails when you cut that half of the joint later. They are very sharp and like all traditional Japanese chisels, these feature a hollow back which make them easier to flatten and maintain. I've never had Japanese chisels before because they're usually very expensive, but I recently discovered these from Narex for a fraction of the price I would have expected to pay, so I decided to try them out. Since this is my first time using them, I can't say a lot about them yet, but so far I've been impressed with Narex chisels, so I expect I'll like these very much. Now let's rewind just a little bit and examine the chisel work in more detail, because the care you show here will make a big difference in how nice this joint looks once you assemble it. That baseline is key. Just as you didn't saw past it, you cannot chisel past it, not even by accident. So I always carefully pair along the baseline to create a shoulder. This shoulder will keep my chisel from skipping backwards across the line when I chop down. But when I do turn my chisel downward to chop, I can't try to take too much material at once or the wedging action of the chisel's bevel will force it backwards toward that baseline potentially compressing or denting the fibers, which will leave a gap in your joint. I only want to chop about one eighth of an inch of material or less away at a time. That's why it's nice if you can get close to that baseline with your coping saw. Otherwise, you have to pare that extra waste backward a little bit at a time toward the line before chopping the final eighth or sixteenth inch of waste away with your chisel. I've gone down halfway on one face, then I flip the workpiece and I finish from the other face. As I chop, I tilt the handle of the chisel just a little bit toward me. This creates a slight hollow or valley in the end grain between the pins, which ensures that I won't have any hills or lumps that may keep my joint from fully closing. Repeat this process on both ends of both pin boards, then we can move on to the tails. At this point, we should add to our labels because we will be custom cutting each group of tails to match the pins and all of the pins are slightly different because you cut them by hand. So each corner of the box is numbered on both the pins and the tails half. Now the freshly cut pins are placed on top of the mating tails board with the labels facing inward just as they would be on the assembled box. Hold carefully so nothing moves as you trace each pin with a fine mechanical pencil or a knife. Use a square to extend the lines across the end grain and a pencil to mark the waste areas which are the small triangular sections this time. Cutting the tails half of the joint requires a little more precision, but it's still just a cut straight downward because we're going to use a square to angle the board in the clamps on front of the workstation so we don't have to tilt the saw to the side to make our cuts. Like I said before, if you can cut straight down, you can dovetail. Now comes the critical part that new dovetailers often neglect, and if they do, they are sure to get loose sloppy joints. When you cut the tails half of the joint, you must cut on the waist side of your line. Do not cut right on your line. Leave the line there or your joint will be way too loose. When you've cut all the sides of the tails that slope one way, tilt the board in the other direction and cut the opposite sloping sides. These are just short cuts, only about a half inch or so deep. It shouldn't be difficult to be precise. Just keep your body square to the board and cut straight down on the waist side of the line. Use the coping saw to remove the waste between the tails and turn the board sideways so you can cut away the waste on the outside shoulders. Just as before, stay a little above the scribe baseline. Paring away the remaining waste with a chisel is done exactly the same way as it was on the pins half of the joint. Because I only had a tiny gap between my tails, I couldn't fit my smallest dovetail chisel in there, so I had to use a regular eighth inch chisel. This risked bruising the corners of the tails 
because that chisel doesn't have those steeply sloping sides. So next time I'll cut a wider center pin so there's more room in between the tails for a proper dovetailing chisel. As I said before, make sure there are no high points on the end grain that may keep the joint from going together. One last task before assembly. I like to cut chamfers on the inside of the tails, staying away from the corners. This will help the joint slide together. The nice thing about pine is the joint can be a little tight and the wood will compress, but don't pound too hard or you may split your board. If it's too tight, you might just have to do a little more work with the chisel to get things to fit properly. This is a shallow drawer. Even if you fill it with dovetailing tools, the contents won't be very heavy. So I opted to keep it simple by just gluing and tacking a plywood bottom on. It will be plenty strong. If you're looking for some dovetailing tools, I'll put some links to my suggestions below this video. And don't forget to check out the set of plans and build instructions for the workstation, including the step-by-step -step dovetailing guide to get you started. See you next time. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.